Hi friends, this is John. I'm passionate about developing regenerative agriculture systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce food of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I've been fortunate to meet many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems. However, much of this knowledge and information is scattered all over the place. There are many incredible stories and a lot of knowledge that have not been widely shared. I founded Advancing Eco Agriculture in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more coherent fashion and incorporate it into products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agriculture systems become the mainstream globally, the status quo against which all other growing systems are compared. To achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned in the last decade and make it available to everyone. These concepts and principles about regenerative systems can be applied anywhere, and when they're properly applied, they will increase farm profitability and resilience to climate stress. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or topics of ideas that you would like for me to discuss, please connect on social media or email me, john at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Be sure to sign up for our email list at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Hope you enjoy, and thank you for listening. Because AEA produces this show, that means that we do not have to sell ads and we're not beholden to advertisers. This gives me the freedom to host anyone that brings value to the community and to gift free promotional space to organizations that help impact the regenerative agriculture movement. You'll notice that this season we're airing short messages from organizations that are doing great work in the sphere of regenerative agriculture and food. Part awareness spreading, part thank you, part community impact service, we realize that this show is a great platform to offer a wide audience to folks that we want to support. We hope that you'll check them out and get involved and support them as well. If you are a grower on the East Coast, you may be interested in NOFA's summer event. Hi, this is Julie Rawson. I'm the executive director of the Northeast Organic Farming Association, Massachusetts chapter. I would like to invite you today to the NOFA Summer Conference, which is happening on August 9th through 11th at Hampshire College in Amherst, Mass. You can look it up on nofasummerconference.org and register. We've been around since 1971 in the Northeast region of the country, educating people about organic agriculture. This year's keynoter will be Sander Katz, plenary session with Chris Nichols, a number of good intensives for people who want to go deeper into fermentation, cut flower production, herbal products, and uh, hemp, and also things for teens and children, 150 workshops, entertainment in the evening. People are always happy at the NOFA Summer Conference because it is a place of hope and great inspiration and great knowledge sharing. You can find out about the NOFA Summer Conference at nofasummerconference.org. If you're based on the West Coast, you may want to attend the inaugural Healthy Soil Summit at the UC Davis campus, where I will be hosting a workshop and a live podcast session with an important guest. Acres USA, the voice of eco-agriculture, has been dedicated to the mission of educating growers and non-growers about the benefits of ecological farming practices for more than 40 years. This August, Acres USA will hold the Healthy Soil Summit in Davis, California. Join farmers, consultants, researchers, and others for two days of engaging learning from world-renowned experts in the field of regenerative agriculture, including John Kemp, Gary Zimmer, and Brendan Rocky. Wherever you are on your farming journey, this event will provide you with the tools to enhance the productivity and profitability of your operation through biological practices. Visit AcresUSA.com to learn more about the Healthy Soil Summit. Email us at events at AcresUSA.com or call 1-800-355-5313. AcresUSA, the voice of eco-agriculture. Hi, friends. This podcast is a recording of a live panel conversation I had with a group of friends and growers from across the Midwest where we spoke about how to use cover crops in fields where planting has been delayed and we haven't been able to get crops into the ground on, in time. So we've talked a lot about how to use cover crops in anticipation of next year's crop and to be able to regenerate soil health and reduce weed pressure, safeguard against erosion, and improve our overall farming system. 
I really enjoyed hosting the panel. We had great conversations with some very key points that I think you will all find interesting. I hope you find the information useful and actionable. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Today, we have a bit of a slightly different format. I've invited several excellent growers and farmers who I've had the privilege of working with over the last couple of years to this conversation as well. And so we have Steve Groff, cover crop coach, the infamous pioneer who was using cover crops before there were very many cover crops being used Mm -hmm. in the agriculture space. Glad to have you, Steve. Uh, We have David Kleinschmidt, who's an agronomist and grower from um, Illinois, and uh, Brad Hobrock, also from Illinois, and then David Chance. David Chance, if I recall correctly, is from Indiana. Am I right about that, David? That's correct. That's correct. Lebanon, Indiana. (laughs) All right. So I want to thank all of you for joining the conversation discussion today and wanted to just have a open conversation. In our consulting work, we're having many interactions with growers who are puzzled and perhaps unfamiliar with the opportunities that they have in this season looking at the latest USDA report. At this moment, we still have a significant number of unplanted acres, particularly here in the state of Ohio. As of the beginning of this week's report, we had about 80% of corn acres planted and about 65% of soybean acres planted. And considering this is the first week in July, certainly pushing up against the window of what opportunities remain for the season. And so I often am surprised by the number of growers who are unfamiliar with the opportunities that they have and what can still be done at this point in the year. So I wanted to have a conversation together with us as a group to uh, share some thoughts and ideas about what the possibilities are. So Steve, perhaps I'll go to you first. There is this idea that if it's too late to plant corn and coming the window is rapidly closing on planting beans, then uh, that's it. There's, there's not a lot of opportunities left for us in the year. And the only thing that is left uh, when there's a common perception that I've come across that planting cover crops is a significant expense. We have limited economic resources, and that's not something we should invest in in such a challenged and troubled year. How would you respond to that? I would respond by saying this is a golden opportunity to make lemonade out of lemons. Uh, so if you don't get your cash crop in, and you've always wanted to try cover crops, you have no excuse not to try cover crops. Uh, the, the thing of it is we have so many options. Steve, I can't afford it. And, oh, you can't afford it. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, you know what? The thing about it is though, we have these options of multiple species and everything. We can actually create and make nitrogen for next year You know, in our corn crop. I have seen time and time again we're in a prevent plant situation or in a similar opportunity like after wheat, which is kind of the same kind of a uh, planting window here that farmers have had to use little to no nitrogen the following year for their corn. So that should get your attention, John, uh, because nitrogen is a, is an expense. Uh, so that would be my first comment to that. But you know, what is the value of increasing your soils health, increasing the aggregate stability and all these many things that cover crops can give Give for you. Uh, so I would say, in my experience, I'm talking to many, many farmers who have said that this was a situation where really it got them into cover crops, where they were actually tested and tried them, and uh, they were able to to see the benefits. I have heard of situations where farmers had wet spots that dried out. They planted cover crops, and then they said from then on they saw a difference in their fields where those cover crops were planted. Thank you, Steve. David Chance, what uh, experience have you had with cover crops in similar situations, and what advice do you give to growers when you speak to them in this situation? That's a good. Uh, that's a good point. I guess we've been we've been working with cover crops here um, on our farm since 2006, and have tried a lot of different types of things. And I'll kind of echo what Steve had said as well in terms of this is kind of an opportunity to actually kind of follow the ground and to grow a diverse species uh, cover crop and break some of the the normal corn soybean rotations that we have and um, also you know able to probably grow a significant amount of our nitrogen for next year as well and um, basically add uh, liquid carbons of different uh, 
different taste to the microbes and uh, really kind of generate, kind of jumpstart a microbial system that uh, will have lasting benefits. I see it as a very, very large opportunity and there's a lot of different uh, species and a lot of different uh, combinations that can be used. And, and some of them can be just as simple as just boats and clover, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be 16 or 20 species. It, it, it can be, it can be what you want to make it, but it can be very beneficial. And it really is a golden opportunity. You know, in, in scripture, if you look at the old Testament, it talks about a seven year rest and um, we've not really had in my career or probably the history of the United States, a seven year rest on our lands. And um, looking at this a little bigger picture, I feel like God's maybe giving us this opportunity to have a rest that uh, our land needs and cover crops can play into this rest very, very well. Well, if you continue the uh, biblical narrative, when the nation of Israel did not provide their land with the rest voluntarily, it was forced upon them. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Rather brutally. <laughs> yeah. One of the questions that comes to mind for me, there's been a recent announcement that the USDA is permitting the cropping of cover crops and the harvesting of cover crops in uh, at some September 1st instead of in November, as has historically been the case. And this raises a question mark about the role of crop insurance and um, USDA in influencing decision making, etc. But one of the questions that I would have for you as a group, and perhaps Brad will go to you next if you have any comments on this question is, how much of an influence should the ability to harvest your cover crops make on your cover crop decisions and, uh, and what you decide to do on your farm? At this point in time, um, especially due to uh, cattle producers uh, who need the hay for feeding, it does create an opportunity for an additional income source due to the USDA uh, changing that date to September 1st. So it definitely has uh, plays a big role potentially for, uh, I know a lot of people in central Illinois and probably the Corn Belt. Brad, with the availability of additional income opportunity, I guess the question that is in my mind is, how does that opportunity compare with the opportunity to just grow a cover crop and sequester nitrogen for next year's crop, as Steve was describing? Can you do both of those at the same time? Is it an either or discussion? How do you make those decisions and choices? Can it be done at the same time? Uh, yes, it can. Um, I think there's an opportunity also that having discussions with some of the local cattle producers um, to see what their needs are. Uh, certainly not everybody is going to look at that avenue. Um, still, in my opinion, the, the greatest benefit behind cover crops is improving active carbon levels in the soil. And we've proven that that also is a very, very close correlation to yields the following year as well. Thanks, Brad. David, Kleinschmidt, we haven't heard your voice yet. Uh, the conversations you've been having with growers that you work with, what are you hearing from the countryside in terms of uh, growers' interest in cover crops, and uh, what are the major reservations and question marks that they have? So this year reminds me a lot of 2012, really, with our drought year. It gave us an opportunity to plant cover crops then, and it's kind of a kind of echoing what Steve and David said, you know, it's given us a golden opportunity to go ahead and seed some things that we typically wouldn't. A couple of things that I, I hear a lot of, though, is guys that are just looking at, uh, you know, the cereal rye and maybe radishes or something. And we kind of got to understand the difference between cool season and warm season grasses and legumes and when they can be, when they should be planted for the best success. So that's, that's probably the, the biggest concerns I hear. And then, uh, of course, you know, if a guy had put down any fertilizer or any residual herbicide applications on those fields and looking to see, you know, what species could then be planted uh, and trying to make a plan for that. Uh, also managing the carbon and nitrogen for that following crop year as well. Thanks, David. That leads me to a question that I have for each of you. 
conversations I have, many growers are asking the question, particularly those who don't have a history with growing cover crops, is what should I choose? This is now the beginning of July. What are the cover crops that I can choose that are going to make the biggest difference for me? Uh, let me see. Let's start with um, David Chance. David, you mentioned that it can be something as simple as oats and clover, but the grower has an opportunity to put in something to really optimize what is happening in his soil. What would, what would your general recommendations be? Where would you begin? It's kind of a, another good question. I had to, actually had a friend this morning um, that had a situation uh, where he was looking at nitrogen production and looking at his equipment that he has to actually plant cover crops, a 15 inch row planter. In this particular event, probably the biggest bang for his buck would be uh, using Austrian winter peas, um, inoculated, um, probably in 15 inch rows, planted RTK, um, so that he would have the option to uh, plant corn in between those next year and have a nitrogen source. It would probably be a very big bang for his buck, however, a single species. So, you know, that's that's one one way to look at it. A lot of times, the biggest bang for the buck, in, in, in my opinion, in my experience, has been mixing basically a grass, a good grass species with a good legume species, with a good brassica species, and a good broadleaf species that kind of get along with each other, don't, you know, uh, shade each other out, but, but offer, uh, you know, those different synergies, you might say. It can be as simple as four things together, five things together. Um, if somebody's really hesitant on trying cover crops, you know, the oats, radish, you know, medium red clover, Atlanta clover, something like that can be fairly economical and uh, still offer, you know, a multitude of species that are going to break those rotations and uh, really start turning the microbiome and that soil on, which is really at the end of the day what we're after doing. We're after covering the soil, anchoring it down, growing roots, putting that liquid carbon in there for those microbes, you know, kind of accomplish a multitude of those things. So it kind of depends on the situation, but I do generally like to mix those four types of species, good grass, for instance, oats, where we use a lot of oats in our uh, mixes, probably along with uh, buckwheat. Buckwheat's a really nice uh, broadleaf that uh, seems to scavenge uh, P and K really nicely. We've done some flax as a broadleaf. We like the cilia, but it's so darn expensive, it becomes a little bit difficult to manage on a cost perspective. And then legumes, we'll, we'll you know, work with, uh, with peas, clovers, vetches, and uh, I'm not as big on brassicas anymore as I used to be. I still like radishes. I still like turnips, kale, things of that nature. But um, I, I just kind of sprinkle those in anymore. Um, I find more value in, in uh, the grasses, legumes, and, and some of the broad leaves. Um, don't know if that answers your question, but that's uh, that's typically how I respond. That's a great answer. Thank you, David. And. I'd like to go to Brad Hobrock. Brad, what uh, what general recommendations would you make to growers who are just starting out and have questions about how to begin with cover crops? Uh, David Chance really hit the nail on the head in, in a lot of aspects of it. You know, with that said, um, I also do believe that you know can we can start fairly simple. Uh, he had also mentioned kind of oat clover mixture, fairly simple, uh, fairly economical uh, mixture there. Um, but also, you know, if there is a possibility still for, you know, maybe bailing some of this for some, some local cattle producers, I think that's a discussion that you need to have also with some of those folks uh, to make sure that, you know, you are planting what they may want or need. Very good thought. Thanks, Brad. Brad, would you consider, uh, would it be appropriate or would there be an appropriate trade-off to consider planting a crop that matures quickly as a forage crop, such as, uh, say, oats, for example? although it might be getting late for those, but still producing a forage crop before the September 1 deadline, is that something that would still be a viable option? In certain areas, I think so. But uh, if you look you know, here in central Illinois, uh, it's raining here again right now. We had another two and a half to three inches here a couple of days ago. And so there's still a lot of fields that have water standing on them as well. And so um, due to current soil conditions, um, that actually might be a limiting factor in that respect. Got it. Thanks, Brad. Steve Groff, 
you look at a lot of cover crop opportunities and uh, challenges and strange situations all over the world. What, where would you make a recommendation to begin with cover crop planting? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say start thinking about what do you intend to plant next year in that field. That can help set up the type of species you might want to use. Uh, the thing, too, that I want to mention is that there's hardly anything better than sorghum sedan grass uh, to be planted now. It grows very well in the heat of summer, and it, it puts carbon in the soil. But there's one thing that we rarely hear about. These soils, a lot of them have been saturated. And when they do dry out, which we don't know yet, some of them, we don't know when that's going to be, uh, the mycorrhizae population has been suppressed because of extreme wet situation. And that's something that people don't think about. I ran into this in uh, some previous uh, wet periods of time where, where you have something like sorghum Sudan can really help rejuvenate that mycorrhizal population that's going to help us. And I think that's some of the benefits that we haven't really focused in on. But um, So I'll just say sorghum Sudan is what you want to build it on. And then some legumes would be sun hemp and uh, cowpeas. Those are the two seems to be the cream of the crop for the legumes. Uh, and then throwing a brassica in there like a radish now is, is, a, is kind of the common tactic that's being used. The nice thing about those fast growing summer legumes, sun hemp cowpeas and or sorghum sedan grass is the grass. They grow very quickly. The radishes are underneath the canopy, don't do much. And then when we have that first killing frost in the fall, then that, that opens up the canopy. The radish then starts doing its job. It helps pick up the nitrogen that the legumes made carries it over to the following season. So that's a nice three-way mix. Of course, there's another dozen or two dozen other species you can mix in there. So I would, again, I appreciate the, the theme here. Keep it simple, but if you're if you're one who uh, is, is, is down the road or you feel confident that someone's gonna give you a good mix, you know, this is an opportunity to plant that 12-way mix. Nothing else you can brag to your neighbors. Uh, how many species you had. But still, I think there's some validity to it if it's created correctly. So that's just some of my comments to build on what was uh, previously stated. Great comments, Steve. And we've actually observed tremendous responses from planting cover crops. And in this situation, when you have preventive planting with due to flooding and inoculating those cover crop seeds with mycorrhizal fungi. Right. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a lot of growers who use BioCoat Gold for that. and. The results are really substantial because, as you said, the, the soils are really suppressed in this situation. One of the things that I haven't heard at all, and just putting it out there as a question mark, should we consider using summer annuals that uh, have a relatively short lifespan, such as buckwheat? Do they fit into cover crops at this time of the year at all? And I'll just put that out there for anyone who wants to answer. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Buckwheat and sunflowers. Why sunflowers, David? Well, so I kind of yeah. look at what weeds really thrive in our environment, and we have a lot of pigweeds. And so if you really look at the root structure of a pigweed and the root structure of a sunflower, they almost mimic each other. But uh, not only that, but it's kind of a deep a chapter there as well. But, you know, very, very good pollinator to, you know, attract in some of our beneficial insects, predatory insects as well. It also helps to, to bring zinc and even calcium available uh, in that soil profile. And then by next spring, when you dig up around those roots, you'll find a tremendous amount of earthworms around there. David, uh, Chance, you also responded pretty heartily that buckwheat is a really great idea. What would be reasons you would choose buckwheat and what would be, would be reasons that you would not choose buckwheat? You know, this early in the season, it will, it will go to seed. It, it seeds very quickly and flowers and seeds very quickly and will reseed itself. And typically in the spring, in the following spring, it will regerminate and probably has the potential to be a weed. We are a conventional grower, so we do have the opportunity to uh, chemically terminate most of our cover crops. So that has not been an issue with us. Um, I actually kind of like the idea of that reseeding and kind of getting started um, and then terminating it uh, prior to the next crop. Um, where we have had buckwheat, there is obviously tremendous insect um, attraction. Bees, wasps, there's just different things. And, and, and I like some of these flowering things, um, typically after wheat and in this pre-bit situation is similar to after wheat, 
we can put some things like buckwheat or flax or phacelia at the end, sun hemp that actually flower at different kind of times. And it really is uh, attractive to all these beneficial insects. And where we've had buckwheat, where we have done pretty intensive soil testing um, without added, you know, minerals through purchase, we have seen phosphorus levels and potassium levels actually um, increase uh, significantly on, on our soil testing. So um, I like buckwheat. It's, it's a reasonable price. It's easy to put in. You kind of look at the plant. It's kind of a puny looking plant. You dig the roots up. They're not super impressive, but it's one of those things that must be the sugars that it produces through those roots. It must be magic to those microbes. Yeah. In my personal observation, the two cover crops which loosen soil and increase soil aggregation really substantially are oats and buckwheat. They're just very difficult to match in what they do. And also, they have, as you described, both of those crops have a substantial impact on increasing phosphorus availability. And to the comment about weeds, I, I always hear this comment that, oh, buckwheat can, can become a weed. And my response to that is, if you can't control buckwheat as a weed, then you really can't control anything else either. Because <laughs> if, even if you're not using herbicides, if you're an organic grower and you're doing cultivation, buckwheat is so easy to cultivate out. If, if you have a problem with buckwheat, you really have a problem. You have a bigger problem. Steve, do you have any thoughts or inputs on uh, buckwheat? Yeah, I would say, um, and I like buckwheat for all the mentions, all the reasons mentioned, but again, it comes to what is your next crop going to be and when is it going to be? Um, let's just theoretically say you might go to wheat. Uh, not many people do, but you know, you might go to wheat. So then that's going to be probably in October. So you don't have a lot of time there and the buckwheat would be very appropriate to do that. The problem with buckwheat when you use sorghum sudan and sun hemp and even cowpeas is it kind of almost as fast as it grows, it's a little hard to compete in there unless you make room for it. And this is the thing about mixes and, and mixes certainly don't have to be expensive. You have to, sometimes you get down to ounces per acre of some of seeds in a mix. And when you have, you have to understand that you, if you're using sorghum sedan grass, you gotta cut that rate down to two, three, four, five pound per acre maybe, if you want some of these other species to survive. And, and that's, I think is a key when you're kind of making up your, your mixes here. So I, have, I would put buckwheat in a mix, uh, but you have to accommodate it. You have to leave room for it. Uh, it's a fast grower, but I'm telling you, sun hemp and, and uh, sorghum sedan will beat it. And if you if you have you know 10 to 15 pounds of each of those, your buckwheat's not going to do a lot in there. It will probably be out competed. So these are these are things you just have to um, kind of uh, you talk to someone or seed provider who has experience in crafting these mixes. It is something that you do need to have some knowledge or expertise or experience in order to get these mixes to be effective and then not break the bank, so to speak. Thank you. We have a question that has come in here uh, from David Miller. Glad to see you here, David. I'm an organic farm. I have a crop of triticale that I will be harvesting for seed. There's a small amount of clover, vetch, and some low-growing wheat. If I cut it really low, can I no-till sun hemp and sorghum without using it an herbicide? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll chime right in on that. I would say as soon as the straw is bailed, if he's going to bail the straw, go plant immediately. Um, Probably a few weeds here and there, but those sorghum sedan and sun hemp, they grow so fast. Uh, I think you're I think you're gonna be okay. And if it's just sorghum sedan and sun hemp and you wanna keep weeds down, keep your rates a little bit on the higher side. It's kind of a different thought, what I just mentioned. Because if weed control is one of your objectives here, and that's why it's so important to think of what your objectives are for this crop, because that'll determine your seeding rates and, and so forth. This is just an example where you know, I would suggest 10 to 12 pounds of uh, sun hemp and probably 10 pounds of sorghum sedan for using those species. If you really want to do weed control, maybe up those rates even 20% higher than that. Uh, but that's just a, a, a foundation to jump off of. And if you are planting no-till, how deeply would you plant those, Steve? About one inch. Okay. A question that I've asked a lot of people on the podcast and which I really enjoy asking people in conversations one-on-one -on -one is what is the question that I should be asking? What's the question you wish I would have asked? So I would like to ask you that question from 
a grower's perspective. If you are having a conversation with a grower, uh, what is the question regarding cover crops at this time of the year that you that the growers should be thinking about? What are the primary considerations they should be thinking about? Steve, you've already answered this question to some degree by describing how they should be thinking about what crop comes next. But what are some of the key considerations for planting cover crops at this time that growers frequently miss or that they don't think about? David Kleinschmidt, why don't we begin with you? What's the question that growers should be asking or should be thinking about? So the number one thing is, well, two things actually. What is your budget? how much you want to spend on your cover crop, and then what are your goals that you want to achieve. A lot of times when I'm working with a lot of farmers, I have a, a list of about you know, 12 different objectives that a farmer can pick and choose from to, to achieve a, some sort of goal. It's not a checkbox, you know, it actually prioritizes, you know, one through 12. A lot of times, you know, when the first thought comes into mind about cover crops is erosion which is great, you know, we need to keep the soil in place, but there are so many other benefits that a cover crop can provide to farmers. And, and until you actually start to discuss that with them, they really don't um, think too much about it. Thank you, David. Brad Hobrock, what thoughts do you have regard, around this? What is the question that growers should be thinking about when they think about incorporating cover crops? Once again, David, um, hit the nail on the head is well, what's your goal, what's your objective? Um, because simply just going out and planting cover crops kind of blindly, I mean, can it provide some results and things that uh, ideal things we want to see? Yes, it can. But we have different different environments. We have different crops. And, and so certainly next year also, you know, what crops going to follow up with this? Because certainly managing those seed in ratios it's very, very critical, especially if it is going to another grass crop, say corn, wheat, et cetera. Brad, you mentioned referred to managing C to N ratios. Why does that matter? Why is it important? It plays a big role, especially in nitrogen availability, not just nitrogen availability, but that's the big one. Um, certainly, if we're not addressing that properly, we stand to have significant uh, nitrogen tie up that will not be available to, a, to the crop next year, especially if it, again, uh, corn, wheat another grass uh, of that sort. Thank you, Brad. David Chance. Yeah, so I think everybody's kind of nailed that one, really. I think objectives is be, you know, what type of crop are you planning on planting next? That's obviously, I think, probably the first question. The second question for a conventional grower is what type of chemistry have you um, already applied? If you have applied uh, chemistries that uh, have long residual activity, you need to read the labels. Certain very small seeded uh, you know, species uh, can react adversely to that. Um, so I think understanding where your chemical program has been, understanding what type of crop you wanna grow, and then actually understanding the objective of each field. Is there a drainage problem in a field that uh, needs to be addressed, you know, with uh, perhaps like sorghum sedan grass, as Steve mentioned, and that's an awesome opportunity to put sorghum sedan in this early in the season, as an example. Or, you know, are you, uh, are you growing corn and, um, you know, nitrogen is your primary objective, then, you know, you need to be kind of shifting toward the idea of some of the perhaps mixes of summer legumes and winter legumes and, and maybe, you know, some sprinkles of grasses and things, um, oats and, and different things like that. Or are you growing soybeans, you know, cereal rye and soybeans, they kind of have a synergistic effect. Where cereal rye and corn, I know a lot of people do it, but Dave's experience has not been good with that. So Dave does not do it because of allelopathic effects. That can be a problem. So understanding what you're going to grow the chemistry you've used and, you know, the objectives, uh, whether it's nitrogen, whether it's mycorrhizal fungi, whether it's, uh, you know, trying to build carbon levels, just kind of a series of questions that I think everybody's done a pretty good job kind of answering. Thank you, David. Steve, saved you for last. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to build upon what David just said with the chemistry. There's an easy, there's an easy way to figure that out because you know, with the amount of rain we have, and, and I understand the half-life of chemistry and everything, but the best way is to take a shovel, go out and gather, you know, just like you'd be soil testing about, just but just go about four inches deep, get a couple shovelfuls, put them in a five gallon bucket, mix it up, and then go plant your cover crops that you intend to plant in there and see how they do in about 10 days, you'll know. Yeah, that way you can feel a little more confident that you're not gonna have issues uh, with any herbicide 
uh, effects. The other thing I'll just tag on with that is fertility. Some of these fields had had nitrogen applied or fertility applied. Who knows what's left with all the rain, especially nitrogen. But if you did apply nitrogen, you for sure want to get a grass in there to capture that and hold it. I, again, uh, depends on what your crop is next year. But even if it is corn, you know, using a sorghum sedan, a millet, and some of the grass type species to, to capture and hold that, another good reason to include a brassica because they're really good at that. Uh, so that's just a few things to add to the, uh, I guess, this discussion and this, com and this uh, question. Steve, I'll ask a follow-up question to our earlier question. We spoke a little bit about mycorrhizal fungi and uh, using BioCoat Gold, which is one of our products that we use a lot. And we've also have been having a conversation about, generally all of us here in the group, about uh, adding legumes for nitrogen fixation. Is it necessary to add rhizobium inoculants for these various species that might be specific, such as sun hemp and cowpeas, et cetera? Oh, absolutely, unquestionably inoculate, but specifically in this situation of wetness, because it can actually, I'm gonna say, kill or suppress some of these organisms out there, depending on, on a lot of things, but it's a it's an inexpensive uh, product uh, to put in there. And um, so I'm, I'm pretty adamant, yeah, go ahead and uh, make sure you have the rhizobias on uh, for whatever species. Now, if you do get, you know, I, I guess you wanna know, make sure you get the right strain for the specific species. Now there's some of these companies now have multiple strains in one, in one bag or one packet, so to speak, kind of covers the bases. But, you know, hairy vetch and peas is the same inoculant uh, pretty much. Sun hemp be a little bit different. Uh, so make sure you get the right inoculant on your specific species that you're intending to grow. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to shift the conversation just a little bit and open um, a can of worms that should perhaps remain closed, but I think it's important important for us to talk about. When I visit with colleagues from other countries around the world, it's intriguing to hear the perspective of growers from other places. And one of the recurring conversations is they are amazed by how effectively innovation has been stifled in the United States uh, crop growing community by crop insurance and the effects that crop insurance has on the decisions that we make uh, I think this is particularly relevant to the conversation that we're having about growing cover crops, et cetera. And so there are many who've said that getting away from crop insurance and being able to make decisions for their operation completely independent of crop insurance was one of the key factors that has allowed them to really innovate and to get to a very different place of success on their operation. So I can't speak from experience because I'm not have never been a large scale crop grower, have never been dependent on crop insurance. And so to some degree, I really don't know what I'm talking about, but it is something that I'm certainly curious about. So I'd love to hear each of your perspectives. What is the role of crop insurance? What do you think the role of crop insurance should be? And what do you wish were different? Go ahead, Steve. Oh, you want me to start? Okay. Well, first of all, <laughs> I have to give the caveat, I'm not a large scale grower either. Um, I grow 300 acres on my farm here. I have chosen not to get crop insurance. Uh, and you could say, I don't even qualify to answer this question either, John, I, I get that. Uh, but I've been to Australia and I've seen uh, down there where typically a lot of farmers are growing five or six different cash crops in order to diversify. That's their crop insurance, so to speak, by using soil health principles. So I totally agree. I'm not sure if I would stick my neck out and say we should totally eliminate crop insurance, but if I was in charge, I would uh, dramatically pull it back and open it up. I would actually advocate rewarding farmers who have a history of using cover crops that they shouldn't have any premium. They shouldn't pay any premium for crop insurance because their fields are more resilient. It's gonna be a little hard to prove and everything, but you know, we'd have it. we actually would have the technology to do it. I've been through the halls of Washington DC, USDA several times addressing this issue, John, and it is something I am passionate about and it has caused a challenge to, I'll say, the overall soil health movement. I'm actually hearing people right now, farmers who are actually planting corn, knowing it's gonna to be too late, but they say they'll make more money filing a claim on corn uh, than they will just to leave it go and, and, it's, and, and take the prevent plant option. And you know, farmers hate to do that, but that's kind of like, we have put ourselves as a country in this corner. And so just to sum up my opinion, 
I would do away with most all crop insurance, uh, except for catastrophic cases. Uh, so you opened a can of worms, I just poured them out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Steve. Uh, Brad Hobrock, you are a uh, large scale commercial grower and uh, certainly this influences you a lot. What, what is your perspective? I agree a lot with what Steve had mentioned, um, but I want to piggyback in, in other countries, Australia being one, um, they don't have crop insurance. And so generally they are so much farther ahead of a lot of people within the United States in terms of soil health and continuing to build soils. Um, often in our industry, it's talked about uh, of using sustainable practices. And um, John, this is a comment I've heard you make several times, but with continued degraded soils or continued degraded practices, there's nothing sustainable about that. And we need to be true stewards of the land. We, we need to, do the things that, that we are on here to do, and that's to, to produce healthy crops, high-yielding healthy crops. But there is too much um, emphasis. There's too much, uh, too many decisions that are made on crop insurance. I, um, certainly, it's nice to have it, but I think um, Steve's point that those who are building soils and using covers and, and truly involved in regenerative farming practices, um, I think there should be a huge reward for that. Um, maybe to the point that to actually have crop insurance available to us, maybe we need, everybody has to have those practices involved in their farm. Good thoughts, Brad. Thank you. David Chen, do you use crop insurance? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, and I'm going to take a little different take here. So I would say we're a mid-sized grower. We, we farm about 2,200 acres, and uh, we are pretty much your classic Midwest farm. We grow corn, soybeans, we have hogs, and um, we also have wheat in our rotation. And we do not insure our wheat, as I'll describe here in a minute, but um, I'll take a little different approach on the crop insurance. Crop insurance actually is something that we've paid into for a number of years. Um, we have the RP insurance, which we have the prevent plant option, which we took on uh, a big majority of our corn acres this year. We didn't plant a single acre of corn. We took prevent plant on all our corn acres that we intended to plant. We had shifted some to beans, but uh, it, it, it made economic sense for us to do that and then also have the opportunity to grow cover crops this next year, perhaps in order to grow corn on those acres next year and perhaps lower input costs by maybe growing a lot of our nitrogen. But what I comment on is we've paid into it for over a, you know 25 years of our career and um, we've had a couple of years where we have had large claims. So I look at it from an economic standpoint in that aspect that it is sort of a backdrop for us. Our, our operation is set up, our infrastructure and our investments are primarily around corn and soybean production. And um, the opportunity that crop insurance has given us is that uh, with that backdrop that we have, we have the ability to market those commodities on the futures market at times when they are very profitable. And we know that we have a safety net with, with the crop insurance underneath us. That has been an intangible over that period that we have paid into it, the 25 years we paid into it or so, that's been an intangible that actually has made our operation a lot of profitability because it's given us the confidence to market ahead at prices that give us margin and give us good return on equity and good return on investment. So um, I'm not going to hammer the crop insurance aspect because um, it works for our operation. Uh, as far as soil health, I would not disagree that uh, with the other, other participants in the aspect that it does force us to sort of a monoculture of corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans, or maybe corn, 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 and maybe throw a soybean in there every once in a while. And um, that is not good for soil health, and it's difficult to uh, incorporate um, cover crops and different soil health uh, practices into that mix that, uh, that are going to advance um, regenerative agriculture. We typically try to grow uh, wheat every year for what we call a rehab year. And that's kind of our rest year where we can actually go in and, um, and grow wheat. We can uh, use compost, manures, different soil amendments that are necessary, address compaction, and then get uh, some of these 
cover crop mixes in that are sort of unique in order to uh, really kind of advance our health in our soils. And um, we found that to actually be something that has helped us build our soils in the system that we use, which is a commercial corn soybean system. Wonderful. Thank you, David, for that perspective. David Kleinschmidt, what thoughts do you have on the crop insurance can of worms? It is a big can of worms. You know, some of the struggles have been, you know, I guess in the perspectives of when is a cover crop terminated, does it affect the crop insurance and stuff like that, that's really shot a lot, a lot of people away from using cover crops, I think, just because of the terminology in some of the RMA handbook and everything, and there was a lot of confusion in it. I think it's cleared up quite a bit now. I guess I'm very hopeful for the state of Illinois, uh, for the one thing that we've got going for us is we'll have a $5 premium reduction on crop insurance if you use a cover crop, uh, mimicking what Iowa's done, and uh, so I'm really hopeful that maybe that will help to get guys to do more cover crop practices. But at the same time, you know, I don't know how much, you know, as we build our soils and build our resilience to the soils and everything and start to diversify out of a corn soybean pendulum, not really a rotation, but, uh, you know, if we can, if we really need that crop insurance uh, or if we just need more of that catastrophic, like Steve was talking, uh, wind and hail event type insurance. So yeah, I guess that's where I stand on that. Thank you, David. There are a few questions that I think would be of wide scale interest. Uh, One of them is, we spoke about identifying the objectives of the cover crops that we're growing. If if an objective is to shift the soil's microbial population from being bacterially dominant to being fungally dominant, what are some cover crop species that would really help to accelerate that shift and drive that? And if you have any thoughts or insights on that? When you, when you go to, I would say, higher lignified um, covers that are a little more complex versus higher sugar content, higher sugar content covers, legumes, things of that nature tend to uh, be digested pretty quickly and are somewhat more bacterially dominated. And Steve had talked about uh, you know, sorghum Sudan grass and um, you know, even cereal rye that's left to mature or, or things of that nature that uh, have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio and are a little more lignified and a little higher complex. They typically seem to be a little better food sources for fungal populations. But however, I'll, I'll qualify that. They also need some more bacterially dominated covers in there that, uh, that are quickly um, digested to build the bacterial populations so that uh, the fungal populations will actually piggyback on the bacterial populations as long as they have a food source, a, a highly lignified food source um, to, uh, to basically feed on. So in essence, David, what you're describing is to grow cover crops that have very broad carbon and nitrogen ratios, lower levels of protein and have a lot of carbon. I would agree with that. Uh, there is a very good question that has come up How do you facilitate germination of cover crops in hot weather and dry soil when irrigation is limited? So this is a very real concern because I know of some parts of the country that that where this pendulum has already swung from one extreme this spring to the other extreme right now where soils are already very dry and very warm. So what answers would you have for that? Brad Hobrock, do you have any thoughts or insights on how to manage that? Well, number one, if you have very, very adverse soil conditions, i.e. very, very hot, very dry. From a financial perspective, if we're not likely to get them germinated because of soil conditions are not ideal, then should we be spending any money on it? In some of those situations, and that could even be like a dry land sand here today in central Illinois, you know, here in the Illinois River Valley. But um, simply, if it doesn't make sense, um, is it worth spending the money on? It's probably not. You know, mitigating those things outside of looking at weather forecasts, um, there's not a lot that can be done. Thanks, Brad. It's a pretty thorough and pretty answer. Uh, it's not a nice, it's not the answer we would like to hear, but it is the real answer, absolutely. David Chance, you have any thoughts to add to that? No, I, I, I totally agree with it. You know, if you're in an adverse situation, there's not moisture, and it's difficult to establish them like that. I mean, you, 
I, I would totally agree. I mean, you need to either wait the moisture or, or wait uh, wait to get them, you know, established because you'll be disappointed if you don't get response. I guess it's a question of how severe the problem is. If you have severe challenges with not having enough moisture, uh, if they're severe enough, it's completely impractical. Oh, so let me add to that real quick, John. Um, even even if you get germination to occur, roots still need moisture in the soil to grow. And if we don't have enough soil moisture for that to happen, then once again, there's just no sense in spending that money. Absolutely, Brad. Thank you. Uh, we have one final question that we'll address here. Do we have any thoughts on cover crop species for soils that have been damaged from multiple years of herbicide, tillage, chemical fertilizer? What cover crops could we use that might speed up the bioremediation process of any residues that might still remain in that soil profile? Any thoughts on cover crops that might be able to benefit that in particular, if that is a specific objective? The, the first thought that comes to my mind is root six dirt. So, uh, you know, the annual ryegrass species, bursine clover, uh, crimson clover, balanza clover, can really, really help to remediate those types of situations. Especially in a vineyard, uh, having a, something that's pollinator clover in there can really be beneficial there. David, you just used a phrase that I'm unfamiliar with. You used the phrase root six soil. What are you describing by that? What do you mean? So soils weren't formed by a plow. They evolved by, you know, plants, roots, interaction, microbial interaction, and, and grazers going across much of the, the earth at the same time. So the more roots that we can have out there, more fibrous roots, you know, a lot of people feel think about uh, radishes to help alleviate their compaction issues where actually a, an annual ryegrass with a whole lot of root mass will fix that compaction uh, issue a lot quicker. So it's just a, a term I heard here about a month ago of, of, of roots fix dirt and it just makes a lot of sense. I think maybe uh, Rick Haney says that. Got it. All right. Well, we are coming up to the end of the hour. Do any of you have any final thoughts you would like to add to the conversation, things that we haven't talked about, questions that I haven't asked, anything else that is important to discuss that we've missed? John, if I can real quick, you know, we talked a little bit about bailing some of these forages. We really got to be cautious on the nitrate levels on that, nitrate and persic acid, but, uh, you know, for either it being grazed or being bailed off, uh, to make sure we're not setting ourselves up for a very catastrophic event with our livestock as well. Thank you, David. I want to thank each of you for joining and for being a panelist here. I know that uh, many growers find this information to be very valuable. Uh, many people will be listening to this and uh, I'm sure it'll be very valuable information. So I want to say thank you for being here and thank you for sharing and look forward to having more conversations with you in the future and uh, happy growing. Talk to you soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks John. It's an honor. Thanks John. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess. We measure. We test. We analyze. And we provide recommendations based on scientific data and knowledge and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.